The Presidencies of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. It's always a pleasure to be joined by special guests to discuss their research into presidential history. But as someone who is fascinated by the Grant presidency, it was a particular delight to talk to this episode's guest about his recently released work. Fergus M. Bordewick is the author of eight previous nonfiction works, including Congress at War, How Republican Reformers Fought the Civil War, Defied Lincoln, Ended Slavery, and Remade America, The First Congress, How James Madison, George Washington, and a Group of Extraordinary Men Invented the Government, and America's Debate, Henry Clay, Stephen A. Douglas, and the Compromise that Preserved the Union, named Best History Book of 2012 by the Los Angeles Times. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his wife. Fergus's latest book is Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. In our conversation, we talked about key figures of the time, the intersection of racism and politics, and the legacy of this turbulent time in American history. Without further ado, after this brief message, let's get to the interview. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. Fergus, thank you so much for joining us here on the Presidency's Podcast today. We are so glad to have you here. Well, thank you, Jerry. It's a, I, I appreciate being invited. Before we get into your new work, I just wanted to share with you and with the listeners, even though this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to talk, I have known about your work for years because um, one of your previous works on the first Congress was actually a major source that I turned to at the very beginning of this podcast with the Washington presidency. So as soon as the opportunity came to talk with you about this new work, I was just, I, I have to admit, I was doing some fanboying <laughs> that I was finally going to be able to get to talk with you. Well, you, you're very kind. Uh, and and uh, uh, it, it's, it's a pleasure to know you've read some of my earlier work. Absolutely. And your most recent work is an amazing work as well. For our listeners, the work is Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant, and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. And as we were talking about before we started recording, the Grant administration is one that I've been looking forward to diving into more in the podcast. And so this was a great opportunity for me to be able to do some of that deep dive, and especially with such an engaging work. But to get us started, Fergus, I wanted to ask you what about your motivation for writing this book, because your bibliography of work prior to Klan War spans the history of American politics from the early Republic through the Civil War. So what drew you to exploring the history of the Reconstruction era through political, judicial, and social perspectives? Yeah, well, it, it, a couple of things flowed together. Uh, one is that the this flowed naturally out of my previous book. That's a book called Congress at War. It's essentially about how Congress fought the Civil War and uh, making the the uh, I hope persuasive argument that Congress's work was essential to the winning of the war for the Union, and that Congress was much more deeply engaged in waging the war in various ways than is generally understood. And indeed, much of the um, political waging of the war that's often credited to Lincoln really was coming out of Congress. Uh, it's not a takedown of Lincoln by any means. It's just restoring a, an understanding of an element of the war that we don't really remember. But in that book, I, I focused largely on the people who were then known as the Republican radicals. That's not radical in today's terms. Really, the radicals were those who supported a strong uh, war policy, later a very vigorous reconstruction policy, 
and uh, strong support for the uh, rights uh, of African Americans and and the early liberation of slaves and the recruitment of uh, uh, black volunteers into the Union Army. And that's pretty much in a nutshell what defined radicalism then. So I had written a lot about them, and and it naturally, I naturally wanted to carry them into Reconstruction when the radicals were really in the ascendant, especially once they got the better of Andrew Johnson. And radical Reconstruction was an attempt, a revolutionary attempt to transform uh, the economy, uh, the social structure, and the politics of the South. So the the book evolved that way on one hand. Two, I was writing this and I began writing this in 2020 and continued uh, in 21, 22. And I was thinking a great deal about the urgency of dealing in today's world, in, in the present, with, with radical right-wing agitation in the United States. My book isn't isn't a polemic about today's politics. It's it's history. But nonetheless, uh, looking at how the United States, the federal government, dealt with the Klan, uh, an insurrectionary organization, very numerous. There were hundreds of thousands of members of the Klan, uh, violent, confrontational, as I said, insurrectionary. How the federal government and Americans dealt with that organization, came to grips with it, uh, seemed to me a question worth asking. What succeeded? What didn't? And finally, there's a personal element to this, which is that uh, when I was a young person in college, I, I did uh, civil rights work, voter registration in the South, and I had some run-ins with the Klan. That's the Klan of the 1960s. Mm-hmm. There were three iterations of the Klan. As you know, my book is about the Klan of the 1860s and 1870s. There's a long gap, a long hiatus. The Klan was reinvented in the 20th century. But nonetheless, I, I, I had for years wanted in some way or other to, to come to grips personally writing uh, about the Klan. So that was a long-winded answer to what might have been a simple question. Uh, but that's, that's how the book came to be. Well, as, as listeners of presidencies know, we often have to explore the nuances and sometimes even the supposedly short answer questions, there's so much more to it. So thank you so much for sharing that. And to your point, that's one of the things that really keeps me engaged with history is that even though it is a different time and not necessarily a one-to-one correlation with the present day, I think that there are lessons that we can learn from those about how folks have approached things before and what worked, what didn't, and also just taking heart that we can meet the challenges of today, but also some of that is the details that aren't necessarily the most glamorous, like you were talking about with the congressional role in the Civil War. That's something that's not necessarily extensively explored, and it was so key to that. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Jerry, if I may make a comment here. I, recently, uh, someone asked me, um, does history repeat itself? And I said, no, I don't think it does, actually, uh, but it echoes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hear echoes of the past in the present. And I, I deeply believe we can't really understand who we are uh, as a people, as a country, without understanding our past and being absolutely clear-eyed in looking at our past. I, I, I'm not interested in, let's say, guilt-mongering about the past. It's, not, it's just not interesting to me. I think it's facile most of the time. But I think we need to be very, very clear and blunt and, uh, about how, what our ancestors actually did or didn't do when they stood up, when they, when they were afraid to stand up. And this book is, in a sense, an inquiry into that. What did the Klan actually do? I mean, this is this is a horrific story. It was extremely brutal, and brutal in ways that that uh, 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 are, are very hard to read. Sometimes I, I, I want to say, by the way, the book doesn't needlessly dwell on the most hideous kinds of violence. But I wanted to make clear 
there was hideous violence. And these were Americans, regular Americans that perpetrated it. And, and you know, we should be mature enough as a people to, to just face, face the past honestly and not, not white, whitewash it or erase it. It's not necessary. Absolutely. And, and to your point, Fergus, the fact that there are three separate clans that this, this group is brought back, but they all have their own distinctions. You know, like you said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does echo. And it is important to acknowledge the differences between them. And also, like you said, that, and, and I can second, you know, you, in your work, you don't dwell on the difficult moments and the torture and anguish and, and horror of the first clan. And it's still such an important part of this history to recognize and and know that this was happening. And so, I, yes, absolutely. And so before we turn to the Klan, I wanted to ask you about another group that had already formed before the Klan started organizing, which was working at cross purposes to their efforts. So would you mind sharing what was the Union League and what efforts did they make to advance the aims of Reconstruction? Yeah, the Union League was a very interesting organization. Uh, It was founded in the North during the Civil War as a kind of, um, well, elite mass organization. That seems like a contradiction in terms, but it was to uh, drum up support for the war effort in various ways. Uh, After the war, it evolved into something rather different and became primarily a Southern organization that existed to support the aims of reconstruction and particularly most importantly to support the uh the empowerment of of newly freed african americans and it did a great many things it was a political arm of the republican party essentially the republican party bear in mind was the dominant party in the north the democratic party had been shattered by the war split into northern and southern wings we can talk later about the Democratic Party, if you want to, but the Republican Party had a had a dominant had it dominated uh, the federal government, and also most of the Reconstruction governments in the South for a while, for a number of years. Uh, the Union League was the medium by which the party reached out to formerly enslaved people, and and helped helped acclimate them to citizenship. And, and I should say here that one of the most uh, fascinating and even astonishing aspects of the research that I did uh, was the 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 tremendous dynamism of of formerly enslaved people, and their 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 it flooded schools. Many 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 schools were established under the sponsorship of sometimes the Republican Party, Reconstruction governments, Northern churches, and so on. But uh, uh, former slaves of all ages flocked to school and to become educated. People wanted to be educated. They wanted to learn how to be citizens. They wanted to learn how to participate in free society. And historically, there was a tendency in the long Jim Crow era to think of former slaves as these passive creatures who are just kind of manipulated by so-called carpetbaggers and scalawags and what have you, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, the, the speed with which uh, former slaves uh, moved into public life is really impressive and interesting, as is the caliber of so many former slaves once they could really use their talents and abilities. So the Union League helped further that. The Union League also, to some degree, sponsored uh, black militias self-defense organizations. This was very controversial in the Reconstruction era. There was nothing that terrified former slave owners and white Southerners more than seeing black men with guns in their hands, uh, considering that, that was vir- punishable virtually by death before the Civil War. And there, there's a whole, what should I say, lost cause mythology about about, about armed black militias and so forth, most of which is just rubbish. That uh, militia's Second Amendment, uh, uh, the Second Amendment was very, very urgently understood 
during this period. That was the right of citizens, black citizens, to carry arms. White citizens wanted arms out of their hands. Uh, black citizens wanted to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. So the Union League uh, is, to some extent, evolved, involved in all of this. And also, uh, finally and importantly, as a an engine for, for registering voters. Black citizens uh, register in colossal numbers. They want to participate in, 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 in democracy. It matters a lot. In fact, I don't think there's any group in the United States, any category of people that has been more devoted really to participation in the system than, than Black Americans. Uh, it's very interesting, the Reconstruction period. So the Union League is in the forefront of that, which makes them a target of the Ku Klux Klan and, and uh, of the eventually resurgent uh, Democratic Party in the South. Absolutely. And to your point, you know, we think of the ideals of American citizenship, and we've seen this in the podcast play out as the United States was coming together, establishing the government under the Constitution. You want it an informed citizenry. You want it a citizen militia. You want it citizens to vote. And when these newly freed individuals wanted all of that and passionately worked towards each of those aims, in comes the backlash. And the white supremacy really kicks up and takes in, and these efforts are undermined in every way that they could be. And it's, it's a powerful story. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about your work is that you take us from this high level, what's happening on the national level in Washington, D.C., but you also bring it down to the local level, to what was happening to individuals and, and really humanize this larger narrative of history. It's just, it's, it's really powerful. And it's important to recognize, like you said, that there were people really working to make this work, really working towards reconstruction. And it wasn't necessarily that it was always doomed to fail or that it was always, you know, somebody trying the, the scalawags, the carpetbaggers. You had people who were genuinely invested in this. Yeah, Joe, you, you've mentioned a couple of words there, which I, I would like to pick up on. Yes. One, you, you alluded to the term white supremacy, and we think of that right now as perhaps a rather hot ideological term. It was used by everybody in the it, whites in the Southern states and to some degree in the Democratic Party in Northern states during Reconstruction. People were proud, that's to say Democrats, by and large, former slave owners, were proud of being white supremacists. They used the term. So it's not an anachronism. Uh, and and um, it was, in fact, basically a battle cry of the Klan. Okay. Uh, two other words. You, you mentioned the words, as I did, uh, scalawags and carpetbaggers, uh, which are terms that everybody's used for 150 years or so. But I dislike both those terms. I think they're inherently slurs. They were. They were meant as slurs. Um, and there's a misapprehension of who the so-called carpetbaggers were. They were very, very wide range of people. Uh, I mean, it means Northerners who moved to the South and pers participated in public life. Um, were there, were there any who were a bit venal? Yeah, sure. Yeah, there were. Welcome to America and the, the, the Gilded Age, you know. <laughs> uh, but the, the caliber of many of them, like Albion Tourget in North Carolina, for example, a fascinating, wonderful man, uh, former Union soldier, became a judge in North Carolina, established a business, and became a champion of, of uh, civil rights uh, and democracy in North Carolina. And there were people like Albion Tourget scattered all over the South who were essentially idealistic, quite honest, brave, lost their lives in many cases because the Klan's targets were not only African Americans, they were also white Republicans. Scalawags who were scalawags. Well, 
uh, again, a slur that refers to native Southerners who became Republicans and participated in biracial party building uh, and government in the South. Very wide range of people from very, very interesting individuals. Again, very brave and bold, many of them, to risk their lives. And quite a few of them died or murdered by the Klan, uh, including another North Carolina story, uh, uh, John Stevens uh, up in uh, Caswell County, North Carolina, who was murdered in a horrific way by the Klan in 1870. Uh, Working class, a working class guy who saw the Republican Party as an agency of democracy for working uh, people. The Republican Party during Reconstruction began as a biracial organization. Very remarkable. Whites and blacks working together to try to build a more democratic two-party system in, in the former Confederate states. This was a bold and, uh, uh, to a certain degree, highly idealistic enterprise. Now, it's more complicated than that. I don't want to oversimplify it, but... Uh, uh, so I, I think these 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 terms uh, need to be under, understood better, and we, we we shouldn't just use them without thinking. I, I know you weren't, by the way, but 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 I think as I, as in the book, I try to unpack them, to explain them, so that we th- we all think more about what we mean with this kind of terminology. Uh, same with the word radical, which we already talked about. Absolutely. And thank you for that. And especially for our audience, you know, it's, it's one thing that has fascinated me about the Reconstruction era for a while now. There is so much to unpack. It is, it's not a narrative that is easy to tell. It's, there's so much complexity and there's so much terminology, like you said, and, and terminology is important. It, has been used for good or ill. And it's part of that false narrative that has dominated for decades about Reconstruction. These terms were a part of that. So it's important to break those down. So thank you so much for that. And turning to the Klan, the the other side of this, of course, the name Nathan Bedford Forrest is synonymous in the public consciousness with the First Klan, but as you write in your book, his role was rather limited and sometimes difficult to, as you wrote, quote, define with precision. But you also note that in addition to adding his charisma to the effort, Forrest, quote, pioneered the organized application of terror. So, Fergus, what did your research reveal about Forrest? role in the early days of the Klan, and why do you think his is the name most commonly associated with the organization? Sure. Well, uh, for for those who may not be that familiar with him, in short, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, before the Civil War, uh, was a very wealthy trader in human beings. He was a slave trader. He bought and sold human beings in the city of Memphis. He did. He was very good at it made a lot of money. Uh, and despite having rather rough origins, he was more or less uh, accepted into the uh, uh, governing class of, of Memphis. There was ambivalence about him because slave traders, even though everybody depended on them, were not, were not always held in particularly high esteem. But he was a rich one. And that's what I counted. Uh, during the Civil War, he became a a very effective uh, Confederate uh, cavalry uh, uh, general. Um, very, he was very talented at it. He used his troops when he could, or most effectively in a kind of quasi guerrilla fashion, most effective operating behind Union lines. In, in that endeavor, in 1864, he oversaw the worst... Um, war crime ever committed on American soil outside the Indian Wars, and that is the massacre, the systematic massacre of a black garrison at Fort Pillow, uh, some distance north of Memphis. Uh, those troops were surrendering. They were massacred. Uh, he, he initially expressed uh, pride in a letter to Robert E. Lee about it. Then there was blowback even in the Confederacy, and he backpedaled. So, 
uh, after the war, he tried to get business started again. Well, he couldn't trade in slaves anymore. Anyway, so he tried this and that and several things in, in Memphis. But he, was, he, he had fame within the former Confederate states. He, he was, by their lights, a heroic uh, uh, wartime commander. He was charismatic, personally charismatic. He had that, that something of that physical magic about him that fascinated people. Okay. So Ku Klux Klan was founded in Pulaski, uh, Tennessee, very nice town, south of Nashville, about 80 miles south of Nashville. Initially, it was kind of a local wacky fraternity group of guys, former veterans who just pulled weird, weird antics around town. Among that, those things, though, was intimidating and frightening black people. Within about six months, the, some of those habits, particularly the latter, uh, tended to spread around that part of Tennessee. And meeting in, in Nashville, a group of high-ranking former Confederate officers co-opted this, this incipient movement and systematically turned it into to a terrorist organization with a political uh, and, and social aim. They organized it. Okay. Its aims were twofold. One, to frighten black people, if possible, back into uh, a servility as close to slavery as possible. Two, I, I think arguably this was the, this latter was the more important aim, was to uh, destroy this incipient, fragile two party system in the South, to destroy the the frail republic biracial republican party it was very political nathan bedford forrest was recruited he became the first grand wizard of the clan and this was secret what would you say it was a secret but it was kind of an open secret mm -hmm. and one could say more about that but at any rate so what did he actually do um yes as as you pointed out it's hard to say precisely i mean it was a considerable degree of secrecy uh there there are no minutes of the clan meetings uh in an archive anywhere that i've yet found but there was a lot of information to be gleaned about the clan's operations his membership and leadership okay uh i think most importantly here what he did was help organize the clan's quasi military paramilitary uh, uh, strategy and tactics. That's what he did during the war. He did it during Reconstruction for the Klan. The Klan always operated, uh, virtually always, as mounted troops. One reason the Klan was able to get away with so much was that the federal federal troops in the South, by the way, the numbers were tiny. It's a myth that the South was under this heavy military occupation. In 1868, there were 12,000 federal troops spread over 11 states. And they were nearly all infantry. And if you think about it, if you think about it, it's not so easy for an infantryman to catch cavalry. Exactly. And, and uh, uh, we'll talk, I think, probably a bit later about the military aspect mm -hmm. of the Klan War. But uh, so this was this was Nathan Bedford Forrest's métier, uh, and he, I think, helped strategize the kind of hit and run tactics um the guerrilla style tactics that were the operating uh procedure of the, of the clan uh though bear in mind what the clan was doing and who it was attacking were, were virtually always unarmed men women and children isolated uh in their homes and cabins all by themselves or with their families and 20, 30, sometimes much larger numbers of Klansmen in disguise would ride up, drag people out into the yard, flog them, lynch them, shoot them, rape the wives, rape the children sometimes. Sorry, you know, yes. Did that happen? Yes, it did. And they were dealing with defenseless people. This is, they may have heroized themselves. And, uh, but it was as profoundly cowardly as, as, as any kind of fighting can be. You can't even call it fighting. When they later, later on, had to confront federal troops, federal cavalry, uh, armed with carbines, they they caved. They caved. But that's that's a later part of the story. Yeah, and and 
it's interesting. One of the things that I think you illustrate well, and, and this kind of leads into my next question, because this was very much tied in to politics. This was tied into voting. This was tied into elections. And you know, with your book, you've got a couple of key words, plan, reconstruction, and then grant. And so, of course, Grant is a pivotal figure in your work. And you describe how the two elections that he won in 1868 and 1872 were entwined with this history and politics of Reconstruction. So would you mind speaking to the progression of voter intimidation and coercion that happened across the South in election years during Reconstruction and the role that Black voters had in Grant's two election victories? Yeah, that role was crucial. It was crucial. Black voters were essential in electing Grant. Okay, um, many people don't realize that black men, not women, of course, uh, black men uh, were voting in the southern states long before the um, passage of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote for formerly enslaved people everywhere in the country, because states had the authority to set their own election laws. And where states were governed by Reconstruction Republican governments, and they virtually all were, um, some exceptions, virtually all were before the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870. So you had hundreds of thousands of uh, black men enrolled as voters beginning certainly in 67, really, begins in 67, and then becomes turbocharged. There's an anachronism. Nothing was turbocharged <laughs> in the 1860s, but there you go. Uh, by 1868 and 69, uh, through the agency of the Union League, which we talked about, and other other uh, mediums as well. And at the same time, a percentage of former Confederates are disenfranchised for a while. They are reenfranchised at different times in different states. Complicated story. But for, for, for a time, many of them are not voting. Others disdain to vote in, in, in Reconstruction elections. So Republicans elect uh, a great many members of local governments, towns, uh, towns, villages, cities, um, uh, state legislatures. No single legislature ever was dominated by uh, black members, contrary to lost cause mythology, which 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 uh, ranted and raved about so-called black rule. There was no black rule. It's myth. Yeah, just a myth. And in most legislatures, uh, black members were a modest uh, a modest minority, um, significant within the Republican Party, but a modest minority in numbers. Okay, but at any rate. Um, Black Americans become political very quickly. I mean, they want, as I said earlier, they want to participate in democracy. And they are not just rounded up by uh, so-called uh, carpetbaggers and scalawags. Uh, people are motivated. And they do vote. And they vote in such large numbers in 68 and 72 that it puts they put, those numbers put Grant over the top. So the Republican Party is very committed to uh, protecting uh, black, the black vote in the South. In fact, the party is dependent on it nationally for a while. Eventually, the Republican Party will will kind of lose its grip in the South. But in the late 60s and the early 70s, it's really significant. And uh, uh, the it, it is certainly a factor in, in supporting Grant's crackdown on the Klan. Uh, and it's interesting how you highlight in the book this this progression that, yes, at this point, that black vote and those Southern votes are still so crucial to overall Republican aims and efforts, whether it's electing a president or keeping control of Congress and their efforts that are made. But then you start to see some shifts. You start to see things happening that okay, well, maybe if we let go of this part of the country, we can get votes over here. And it's it's interesting. And we'll talk a little more about that as we go along. 
But one of the folks that I wanted to to bring up and ask you about who was a key part of the Grant administration's response to the Klan is Attorney General Amos T. Ackerman. He's been somebody that I've been fascinated by for years. Uh, this was a great opportunity for me to learn more about him. And I was wondering if you could share with the audience a bit more about Ackerman, his career leading up to his joining the administration, and the role that he played in Grant's war against the Klan. Yeah, uh Amos Ackerman uh, is one of my favorite figures in this entire uh, piece of history. Um, uh, his name unknown to most Americans, unknown. Although, uh, even though he was Attorney General only a bit more than a year, nonetheless he was a very significant Attorney General, and I, I, I think we'd all benefit from knowing him better. Okay, what was his background? He was born in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, Yankee family was well educated. I believe he went to Dartmouth, and uh, but then, like many young men, he he actually went not west but south, uh, first to teach, and then to study the law. So he spent most of his his uh, his life, his, certainly his professional life, in the in Georgia, in Georgia, and he himself before the war owned some slaves. He had a farm, as just about everybody did, uh, besides being a lawyer, and he had several enslaved people on his property. But he was a deeply, a deeply moral Christian man. He was uh, a pre-war Whig. Uh, he was not happy about secession. He very reluctantly uh, served in a, uh, a quartermaster capacity uh, for the Confederate Army. Very. Uh, very, very much behind the lines and not very happy about it. After the war, he pretty quickly embraced the Republican Party and the and it, uh, and its effort to rebuild the South, rebuild the South, both politically and socially. And he he it, it took him it took him a bit a, a bit of time, but also embraced the radical Reconstruction and the full. Uh, emancipation of, of former slaves and so on, and, and moved very quickly, uh, in, in fact, to become a leader of radical reconstruction in, in Georgia. He was picked by Grant to become attorney general. He was the first activist attorney general in American history. Parenthetically, I, I should say that uh, there was no justice department until just about this time, the attorney general previously was essentially the president's lawyer, and that was that, with no staff. Or during the war, only, I believe, it was either one or two secretaries. That was that was it. So under Ackerman, there is a Justice Department, and it's mobilized by Grant uh, with congressional authority. It's mobilized by Grant to go after the Klan. Uh, maybe I should say here that Congress has passed by this point, 1870-71, three very strong pieces of legislation called Enforcement Acts or Force Acts. The third one is called the Ku Klux Klan Act. They're all linked, and they define the terrorist activities of the Klan as federal crimes. Up to this point, the federal government did not have legal authority to act against this because this, were, this was regarded as the responsibility of states states which increasingly are falling under the sway of white supremacist Democrats who will not enforce uh, the law against the Klan. I'm oversimplifying a bit, but that's that's the basic picture there. So uh, Amos Ackerman and Grant are empowered to go after the Klan. Uh, Ackerman himself goes south to South Carolina, which is defined as the epicenter of Klan activity, in South Carolina, upcountry, South Carolina is going to be the the uh, the primary target of the Klan War. The point being, if we can destroy it in in, in South Carolina, we will destroy it anywhere. And the, and there we are. There, there's Amos Ackerman in South Carolina presiding over the prosecutions of the Klan. Well, and and that for me, a learning more about Ackerman, and then b learning his role in. And in particular, York County, because I'm in the Charlotte area and York County is the county that's just south of Charlotte. It's part of the Charlotte metro area. And so to learn more about 
for me, local history was really fascinating. Yeah, it was determined that um, in the upcountry counties, including York, York was really the main target. Yeah, you're quite right. Uh, that in those counties, York and the adjoining ones, uh, from 50 to 60 or 70 percent of the white male population uh, had joined the Klan. In other words, almost everybody. Yeah. Uh, and those who hadn't joined were intimidated by the Klan. And one should picture, and I haven't, we haven't done this in the conversation yet. One should picture what's going on here. I mean, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Klan activists, uh, night riders who are attacking farmsteads, uh, uh, primarily black, but also white Republicans in the middle of the night. They're dragging people out of their homes, killing them in the streets and, and committing all kinds of atrocities, uh, across those counties of South Carolina and elsewhere. Also in North Carolina, Alamance County, North Carolina, another epicenter. Yeah. Rutherford uh, County, North Carolina, another epicenter. But at any rate, uh, they are terrorizing the countryside. Uh, and th- th- up to this point, up to about 1871, they've been winning. They've been winning. They have been scaring Republicans, black and white, away from the polls. Uh, and they've been dividing the Union League racially by racial appeals quite tragic, actually, and thereby destroying the biracial nature as best they can of, of, the, of the Republican Party. Uh, so it's, it's an area that's completely out of control. And meanwhile, while you've got these white militias, these folks out in the localities, you also have political actors who are working against reconstruction at the highest levels of government and in Congress. And one name that that comes up time and again in your book is Carl Schurz of Missouri. And you talk about his journey from being a revolutionary in Europe and part of the anti-slavery movement in his early days to actively campaigning in the South for, quote, an end to carpetbagger rule. Again, that, that term in the lead up to the 1782 election. So what role did Schurz play in the politics of the Reconstruction era? And was the shift in his political alignment a reflection of larger trends or more of an aberration? Well, yeah, Carl Schurz is is another fascinating individual. I mean, I loved writing about him. Uh, He had a very unusual, dramatic, and and politically impressive life. As you said, he came from Germany. He was a radical in Germany, a democratic radical um, who had uh, essentially fled the country to save his own life after the failure of the 1848 revolutions in, 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 in uh, Germany, came to the United States speaking next to no English, but um, was such a brilliant individual. He was, a, he was a scholarly man, brilliant individual that he not only did he quickly learn English, he became a journalist in English. He became a popular orator in English. And if you read his speeches, they're brilliant, brilliant. He was a, 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 uh, one of the, mar- the, the, the really first rank orators of the mid-19th century. And yes, he was an inspired liberal, a word that he would use, and yes, radical before the Civil War, an anti-slavery radical, very political. He um, uh, was became very well known as a journalist, and he managed to lobby the War Department and President Lincoln, whom he knew personally. He used to play the piano in Lincoln's uh, uh, White House. He was uh, 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 appointed a political general. There were many, many, many political generals. He wasn't as good a general as he thought he was. Uh, (laughs) His record was kind of patchy on the battlefield. Uh, was, there are a number of those, it, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at any rate, so after the war, um, I'd keep us here for the next three days talking about his entire career. I'm not <laughs> going to do that. Uh, after the war, he uh, wins election in Missouri, which is his adopted state, uh, as a U.S. senator, as a Republican. Missouri. Uh, as we all know, was a divided state during the war. The Democratic Party remains pretty vigorous in Missouri. There is a very 
the, the Republican Party is split. Uh, Schurz believes that he will not win re-election without support from the Democrats and the more conservative wing of the Republican Party. And he, ad he adapts his views accordingly. And he becomes an enemy, uh, arguably the most eloquent enemy of radical reconstruction. The values that he himself had espoused. I mean, his report from the South before he was a senator on crimes against the freed people in the South is one of the best documents on that subject that exists. It's very strong, very good, directly influenced Ulysses Grant in radicalizing him. But Schurz basically leaves that behind and becomes an advocate for rapid conciliation with the South, bringing former Confederates back into the system as quickly as possible, being as generous to them as possible. And the kindest thing you can say about this, seems to me fairly cynical political um, shift, is that he's guilty of wishful thinking. He would, he's not alone in this. A great many Northerners were in thinking, just if we give the Southern whites a break, they'll, they'll get used to uh, um, blacks in the political system. They'll adapt to it uh, and things will work out fine. I mean, we have uh, given too much to the blacks. Too much adds up to freedom, by the way. Yeah. Uh, freedom and, and, and the vote. Uh, so he argues, argues for conciliation. He travels in the South trying, try, uh, 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 trying to form alliances. And he becomes, I think this is, this is an essential point. He becomes a leader of a breakaway faction of the Republican Party who describe themselves as liberal Republicans. That is not today's category of liberal Republicans. They tend to be actually somewhat more conservative Republicans. Uh, we won't get into, we won't get into a, another discourse on, on language. And uh, it becomes a faction that, that savagely attacks Ulysses Grant. It attacks the radicals. That's to say the pro reconstruction faction in, in the Republican Party and undermines the Republican Party. It weakens the Republican Party significantly nationally and helps, the pay, helps pave the way for its ultimate gradual, gradual yielding to the more conservative wing and finally to the conciliationists and um, to the eventual abandonment of, of radical reconstruction a few years later. So Schurz's role here is not, a, is not a good one. By the way, he didn't manage to win re-election anyway. He essentially politically shot himself, shot himself in the foot. Yeah. And, and that's, that was one of the fascinating things that, you know, he puts all this effort into turning away from what he originally espoused and it did him no good. No, the, 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 the Missouri Democrats uh, basically didn't vote for him. They kicked him into the ditch and uh, elected another Democrat. Which, you know, it, it's like, well, if he's going to turn from. The Republicans, why would we necessarily vote for this guy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and it's interesting because your work, you you not only have these political actors working at cross purposes against the aims of Reconstruction, but you detail numerous instances of how the federal soldiers sent into the South, ostensibly to protect Southern Republicans and Black citizens, would also work at cross purposes. and. So I was wondering if you would mind speaking to how racism in the military ranks hindered the work of Reconstruction. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. I, thanks for asking about that. So yes, there are some federal troops in the South. As I said earlier, only 12,000 of them in 1868. That number is increased a little by 1,000, 1,500, a max of 2,000 by 1871 in order to, to break the Klan. But when you look at how soldiers actually behaved, who were the soldiers? Who were these individuals in, in the federal army? They tend to be working class white men, working class white men, often, say, from the streets of New York and so on. And they are, like most Americans in that era, they are pretty racist. Uh, racism, like you can't avoid this word. Uh, I'm not using it uh, you know, in a polemical way here. 
I'm just using it descriptively as the way America was. And uh, they held a basic distaste for black Americans. Their instinct was not to help them, uh, but often to ignore them, mock them. There are a, There's a case that I, I write about in the book of a federal soldier, a sergeant from New Jersey, actually, who participates in a Klan assassination of a white Republican uh, state senator in Georgia. He eventually testified against the other Klansmen. And in uh, South Carolina, there was a problem of desert. There was always a desertion problem in the army. There was a problem in York County, South Carolina, and Union County, South Carolina, of significant numbers of soldiers, cavalrymen deserting and giving or selling, selling more likely, their equipment to the Klan and being facilitated out of the area uh, by, Klan, by the Klan. So these were men often, not always. Look, there were, there were also men who followed orders. They did what needed to be done. They chased down the Klan, uh, regardless of what their personal views might have been. But they were not the natural allies of African Americans. Uh, um, and to an extent, that was true of the officer class as well. Not always. There were officers who were deeply committed to, to uh, uh, protecting African Americans, protecting the vote, who, who kind of saw the larger picture, uh, or, or through, as a result of personal experience, felt an affinity with African Americans and recognized them as allies and recognized their humanity and aspirations and all that. It's not, not, not everybody was cut from the same cloth, but, um, uh, Sadly, there were a lot of federal soldiers who, who uh, um, were not so interested in, 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 in furthering Reconstruction. Yeah, and, and you do an amazing job at, at talking about how all of this, what's happening on the political scene, what's happening with the small amount of military troops that were in the South, this on the grounds fight against the Klan. And and I will invite our listeners to read your book, Clan War, to really learn more about how this ultimately shakes out. Because the fact that, as we mentioned earlier, that there are three clans, that means that the first clan at some point went into kind of this, into this decline. And in particular, you note in your book how the Colfax Massacre in Louisiana in the spring of 1873, quote, marked the end of the era of clandestine guerrilla warfare embodied by the Ku Klux Klan and previewed the development of coordinated democratic campaigns that paired conventional political movements with open intimidation on a mass scale to recapture counties and states from what their leaders called and this is a term that you used earlier, black rule. Though the Klan worked at times in... Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the Colfax Massacre, as you said, took place in 1873 in, in upcountry uh, uh, Louisiana. In short, it was uh, it involved, and it was a massacre. It's, it's yeah. the only word that can be used for this, by a very large force of armed white men uh, who, had, who even had a cannon with them, uh, the massacre of a comparatively small, but fewer than a hundred, a little bit fewer than a hundred, uh, of black men who were attempting to protect offices that of the, the uh, county government, which had mostly been won by uh, black candidates, fair and square and in, in, in free elections. Uh, one or a couple of white Republicans had also been elected. But at any rate, uh, uh, black citizens of Col Colfax mustered to protect basically the, the, the county government offices. And they were, they were attacked, set upon by this uh, uh, force. Uh, it, was, it was too organized to be described simply as a mob. And uh, they, the, the, the besieging whites slaughtered the men. The exact number isn't known. It may have been maybe 60, 70, 80. Estimates have run higher than a hundred. Uh, I mean, were shot dead, massacred, tied in bundles, and shot to death. It's truly an appalling event. But none of the white men wore wore disguises. They were led by 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 people who were well known, well known public figures, 
uh, or well-known figures, let's say, in, in the area. Um, there was no mystery about who, who committed the, the crimes. And my point in, in writing about that was that by that by then, in, in Louisiana at least, and eventually elsewhere, men didn't bother disguising themselves anymore. Because why was that? Now, just a word or two of context. In 1871 and 72, the federal government broke the Klan. That happened under, under Grant uh, with the with uh, Amos Ackerman's prosecutions and uh, military campaigns, most notably in South Carolina, but also elsewhere. Uh, that happened. The Klan, as an organized uh, uh, movement, pretty much ended by 72, 73, 74 at the latest. Uh, but what else is happening at the same time? Steadily, state by state by state, uh, state governments had been recovered or the perpetrators said redeemed, redeemed by avowed open white supremacists. Uh, the the uh, a, a revivified Democratic Party. Uh, they were able to accomplish that in no small part because by then, so many Republicans had been scared out of politics that that uh, white white Democrats were able to win, win elections. There's more to it than that. It's complicated. It's all in the book. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, but, but suffice it to say. The states have been re redeemed one after another after another. The last one, South Carolina, will be 1875. Uh, Mississippi a little bit before. Well, sorry, 1876. Mississippi, 1875. Uh, Louisiana is another story, but uh, we won't get into it. As somebody originally from Louisiana, I can say Louisiana is always complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really in a category by itself <laughs> during Reconstruction. So, uh, you know. An entire book. It deserves and has had entire books about it. Oh, yes. But uh, so, you know, just looking forward from there I, I, to, to tie off your uh, your question. So once Democrats, uh, white supremacist Democrats are in control of state machinery, they are able to essentially control elections, who votes in them by nominally legal means. Increasingly, by passing legislation which suppresses the black vote and makes it difficult for Republicans to win office, it doesn't happen all at once. But that is that's what's happening, and uh, th that's the birth of the Solid South that existed right up until the uh, 1960s, uh, 1970s to, to some degree. So, in other words, terrorism ceased to be necessary to repress black Southerners once the machinery of the state was in the hands of white supremacists. The Klan that, was, that came into existence in the 1920s was another story. Most of its, members, that, its membership was actually in the North. That's a whole other, whole other story. And the Klan of the post-World War II era is yet another story, reaction to the civil rights, modern civil rights movement. But uh, what 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 the what white redemption achieved was was the triumph in their eyes of the Jim Crow era. Well, and, and it's interesting because you detail you know prior to this point when when the Klan is broken, you almost have like this parallel organization working. You've got the political, the the Democratic Party, but then you've got the Klan or groups like the Klan. But after that point, when you do have these, as you say, you know, they call themselves redeemers, it just becomes entwined. It's just part of the political structure. There's no need for a parallel. You know, they were they were already working together and, and crossing over, but then it becomes it's just the system, and these are the leaders. Yeah, in some states, notably South Carolina and North Carolina uh, in the 70s, uh, no, but not only, also yeah. uh, in other states, you had uh, movements in, in, in the Carolinas, they were called the Red Shirts, Yeah. Okay. which, which were a political arm of, of, of rather a sort of paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party. It wasn't exactly the Klan, okay? It was out in the open. 
They participated in politics. They recruited openly. Uh, they were not terrorist to the same by any means to the same degree as the Ku Klux Klan. They didn't have to be, as as I was saying earlier. The Klan, as such, doesn't doesn't really ride anymore, although until the 1920s. Although the term is sometimes used, there's a verb. There was a verb at the time, Ku Kluxing, which we call intimidate voter intimidation, which means people with white people with guns uh, scaring scaring black people, and and even and whites who stood up to them as well. But um, yeah, I mean, it's all after that. After this, the mid seventies, it's 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 primarily political, political repression, and and if you happen to be black or a a a nonconformist white uh it was essentially a totalitarian situation homegrown all american uh uh enforced by the the elected by white people authorities and by the leading classes of 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 the south the you know the restored white leadership of southern states until uh and until the 1960s and 70s. Well, and and Fergus, as we wrap up our conversation, I wanted to ask you, what was the most surprising thing that you learned in the course of your research for Klan War? And what do you see as the key takeaway for the audience from your work? Yeah, okay. I mean, one of the most surprising things, uh, which I spoke about a bit earlier in our conversation, was the tremendous a drive of African Americans, former slaves, to become educated as quickly as possible and to participate in public life and to exercise their freedoms. Uh, they weren't, they weren't just rounded up by white people, uh, as a herd of, of voters. You now the, the individual agency of former slaves and the a remarkable leadership qualities of innumerable formerly enslaved people. Many of whom were victims of the Klan. Uh, they were specifically targeted. Those who were natural leaders were targeted. They were often killed. Uh, but I, I would say that 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 aspect. I think also, when you really dig into it, the determination, the forcefulness of Ulysses S. Grant in finishing off the Klan uh, while he was still president, uh, his commitment to to the rights of African Americans is personal. And, and it's thorough, as long as he, as he has the political ability to act. And he does lose that once the Democrats regain the House of Representatives in 74. Uh, so I think Grant, Grant come, if seen through the, the lens of civil rights, is a politically heroic individual and triumphant. He's a, he was the most forward-looking he was the first civil rights president in our history. Okay. Genuine civil rights president. Uh, there are other aspects of his administration, which we're all familiar with, which were uh, less successful, though he's by no means this kind of grand failure of a president that uh, the whole lost cause mythology painted him as. Uh, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be looking through that lens anymore. So there are two, there are two things. Uh, what's the ta- takeaway? Well, one is the, the 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 dark truth that Americans uh, are just as capable of of terrorism and barbarism uh, in behalf of their political goals as any other people in the world. We are not exempt. We are not special. You know, the 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 I, I would say again. The Ku Klux Klan was the first organized terrorist movement in American history. It was highly organized, uh, and it, 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 its stock and trade was terrorism. And it was led, and not by a bunch of village louts and losers and so on. It tended to be led almost everywhere by leading citizens, doctors, lawyers, political men, even ministers, teachers, uh, the elites. Of their communities, found were the organizers everywhere, and often the participants in some of the worst crimes of the Klan. So uh, we need to know this. We need to face up to it. And and uh, the the other 
thing that I hope people will take away is that forceful action by the national government, by the federal government, by government at any level, can can stop uh, radical, uh, you know, radical activity, radical insurrection. I mean, I will say, uh, you know, of any variety, but we, what we face in our own day is coming uh, uh, virtually entirely from a uh, gunned up uh, right. I mean, this is just a fact. It's not I'm not saying it to be polemical. And uh, we witnessed a, 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 an example of it, uh, uh, I hope not a foretaste, on, on January 6th, 2021, in the storming of the United States Capitol. But it's, we, 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 need to, we need to face, uh, as a people, the possibility of this kind of uh, danger in our society. And uh, reading about the, the war against the Klan we see how society did it 150 years ago. And this is one of those cases where we have an echo of history in the present day. And when those echoes of history come up, I think that looking back on the past can help us to understand mistakes that were made and also take some strength from characters who who did strive, who did try to do the right thing. They were people just like anybody else. And and I think that's one of the most powerful things about your work. And to our audience, there is so much more that we could have discussed in this. And you can find it all in Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. Highly recommend you check it out. It is a fantastic read and helps to bring these stories to light that help us to understand a history that is just as complex as the present day. It helps us to understand that people were a part of this history in the making and hopefully provides us with some examples to follow of being on the right side of history. So Fergus, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your insight and your perspective with us here on the Presidency's Podcast. Thank you so much for writing this amazing work and look forward to reading more of your work as time goes on. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jerry. I, I've enjoyed talking with you. Uh, we covered a lot of territory. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. And there is so much more to, to cover. So to our listeners, get to reading. Thank you so much. Special thanks again to Fergus Bordewick for his time and the insight that he shared with us for this episode. And be sure to check out his work, Clan War, Ulysses S. Grant, and the Battle to Save Reconstruction. I'll have links to the book on the notes for this episode on my website, presidenciespodcast.com. There, you can find past episodes of the podcast, links to learn more about all of the presidents, and information on how you, yes, you, dear listener, can help support the work of the Presidency's Podcast. Equipment, research materials, and monthly fees to support the podcast can quickly start to add up. So thank you so much to our generous patrons who help to offset the cost. For as little as $1 a month, you too can pledge a monthly donation at patreon.com slash presidencies, which gets you various perks, including a monthly update on what's coming with the podcast and access to an ad-free podcast feed. Those at the $10 a month and higher level are able to talk directly with me once a month about presidential history and can ask whatever burning questions they have about recent episodes or anything presidents related. If you're not ready to commit to a recurring donation, we do have an option for a one-time donation available through buymeacoffee.com slash presidencies. Leaving a rating and review for the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or anywhere else with that capability is also a quick and easy way to show your support. For all of you who share information about the podcast with others, I cannot thank you enough. If you'd like to reach out to me, please feel free to send me an email at presidenciespodcast, that's all one word, at gmail.com. You can also connect with me on social media if you haven't already. I'm available on Facebook, Blue Sky, Post, and Mastodon as Presidencies, on the formerly known as Twitter at presidencies89, and on Instagram and threads as Presidency's Podcast. Last, but certainly not least, I thank you so much for listening. Until next time, stay safe and healthy, 
Be kind to one another and take care, dear friends. From DNA testing to the Dixie Mafia, Crime Capsule brings you new stories of true crime in American history. I'm your host, Benjamin Morris. Join us for exclusive interviews with authors from Arcadia Publishing, writing the hottest books on the most chilling stories of our country's past. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts or on evergreenpodcasts.com. Crime Capsule. History so interesting, it's criminal. It's criminal.